Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Honor to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So this, uh, this little sutta is on uh, page 921 of the Samyutta Nikaya with the BB translation, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi translation, okay? And um, let's see, the sign of here. And it's uh, in the Kanda Samyutta Nikaya, it's called the Paralaya. And uh, it's 81, then parentheses, nine parentheses. So on one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Kasambi in Gositas Park. And then in the morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking bowl and robe, he entered into Kasambi for alms. And when he had walked with for alms in Kesambi, and he had returned from alms round after his meal, he set up his lodging in order himself and took his bowl and robe and without informing his personal attendants, without taking leave of the bhikkhu sangha, he set out on tour alone without a companion. Now this this wasn't really unusual for him to do this, but I guess it just maybe the time frame or something when they got there, he would just take off and he would go for a walk. Why? Well, because every day he spent about um, an hour in compassion in infinite space. And he would look around and find somebody worthy of him getting involved with that person in some way because he could see who was ready to become an immigrant. And the dog has a big opinion about this. <laughs> he's just, he's, it's enough. <laughs> okay. Okay. So then, not long after the Blessed One had departed, a certain bhikkhu approached the, and the Venerable Ananda and told him, Friend Ananda, the Blessed One, has set his lodging in order himself and taken his bowl and robe, and without informing anyone, without a leave of the Bhikkhu Sangha, he has set out on a tour alone without a companion. Friend, whenever the, bhikkhu, the uh, Blessed One sets out like that, he wishes to dwell alone. On such an occasion, the Blessed One should not be followed by anyone. And then the Blessed One, wandering by stage as he arrives in Paralayaka. And there in Paralayaka, the Blessed One, he dwelt at the foot of an auspicious sal tree. And then a number of bhikkhus approached the venerable Ananda and exchanged greetings with him. And when they had concluded their greetings and cordial talk, they sat down to one side and they said to the venerable Ananda, friend Ananda, it has been a long time since we heard a Dhamma talk in the presence of the blessed one. We should like to hear such a talk, friend Ananda. And then the venerable Ananda together with those bhikkhus approached the blessed one in the Paliyaka tree at the foot of the auspicious Sal tree. And having approached, they paid homage to the blessed one and they sat to one side. And the blessed one instructed, exhorted, inspired, and gladdened those bhikkhus with a Dhamma talk. Now on that occasion, a reflection arose in the mind of a certain bhikkhu thus, 
how should one know? How should one see? For the immediate destruction of the taints to occur. Blessed one, the blessed one having known with his own mind, the reflection in that bhikkhu's mind, he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, this dharma has been taught by me discriminately. The four establishments of mindfulness, they have been taught by me discriminately. The four right strivings have been taught by me discriminately. The four bases of spiritual power have been taught by me discriminately. The five spiritual faculties have been taught by me discriminately. The five powers have been taught by me discriminately. These seven factors of enlightenment have been taught by me discriminately. The noble eightfold path has been taught by me discriminately. So he's talking to them about the 37 requisites of enlightenment in this framework very clearly. Four foundations of mindfulness, four right kinds of strivings, which is four steps of right effort, okay? The four bases of spiritual power, the five spiritual faculties and the five powers, and then the seven factors of enlightenment and the eightfold path. Now, because in regards to the Dhamma that has been thus taught by me discriminately, a reflection arose in my mind of a certain bhikkhu. How should one know? How should we see? How for the immediate destruction of the taints to occur? This was the monk's question. And how, bhikkhus, should one know? How should one see for the immediate destruction of the taints to occur? Here, bhikkhus, the uninstructed worldling who is not a seer of the noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, who is not a seer of superior persons and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, regards form as self and that regarding bhikkhus is a, is a formation and that formation, so that opinion, okay. What is the source? What is its origin? From what is it born and produced? When the uninstructed worldling is contacted by a feeling born of ignorance, contact craving arises. And thus the formation is born. So this opinion comes forth from the moment that you have a feeling come up and feel that, and then you touch craving. And then that is when the formation is born. So thus monks, the formation is impermanent. It is conditioned, dependently arisen. That craving is impermanent, conditioned, dependently arisen. That feeling is per impermanent, conditioned, dependently arisen. And the contact is impermanent. Conditioned, dependently, arisen. And that ignorance is impermanent. Conditioned, dependently, arisen. Let's look, go through that again. So the formation is impermanent. It comes, it arises, it's there, and it leaves. 
Mm -hmm. And the craving we know is impermanent. All states are impermanent. So impermanence is change. It's going to come, be there, but then it's going to go away. And you're not going to be the one that makes it go away. It just happens if you watch things inside, they come, they arise, they're there, and then they pass away. And that's what the Anicca is. And the feeling is the same. The contact is the same. And the ignorance is impermanent. It is conditioned and dependently arisen. Now, it's saying dependently arisen, so actually it's talking to you here about the links and dependent origination, right? Yeah, so if we have the, um, we're, we're talking about these links, and each time we know we have the sense door, and with sense door and a sense door object and a sense door consciousness, so the eye sees color and form and eye consciousness arises. So these three components makes contact. And with contact as condition, feeling arises. With feeling as condition, then craving arises. With craving as condition, I'm going backwards. I don't know why that's going backwards. <laughs> Formation and then create that craving is impermanent. That feeling is impermanent. That contact was impermanent. And ignorance, I see what I did. Okay. So with ignorance as condition is contact, with contact uh, as condition, feeling, with feeling as condition, craving, with craving as condition, then this formation in the mind, you see. So it's all affected by Anicca. That's what's important. Now, this is an interesting sutta, you know, because it doesn't have all the links and it puts them in a funny order. But why does it do that? If you have a copy of the, I was going to show you that, and I think I can do it. I'm not sure if I can make this camera show it to you. But in the Vasudhi Maga, in the very back of the book, we always laugh, he hit it to the very last page. There's a little, a little diagram, you know. And this diagram, let's see if I can do it for you. Okay, this diagram is tiny. Whoops, there. Whoops. How can I make that work? See, it's small. It's a small little. <laughs> I'm not sure how I can do this. Maybe if I, um, I remember something. If I turn the um, alert, if I turn the picture off, how do I do that? I don't see it. A minute. Okay, there we go. There we go. Um, choose the background and take none. Okay, when I have none, now I can show it to you. Okay. Mm. Okay. See this? There's a little tiny map in the back page, the last page of the Vasudhi Maga. And it has three sections on it in the back, okay? And when you look at that little diagram, the past is ignorance and formations. And then consciousness, mentality, materiality, uh, the six-fold base, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, and becoming. Those are the pieces. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They have eight pieces there that are in the present time. That's what they like to talk about. That's happening in this present life, you see. And the future is about birth going into the future and aging and death going into a future. That's how this little chart is set up. And because of that, this, the way he's talking he's not including all these pieces. He talks about ignorance, but then he, um, let's see, he talks about, he starts with formation. He doesn't really, yeah, there you go, formation. And then what he does, when he says formations, he goes all the way up to talking about uh, contact and feeling and craving. 
And see, they're part of the seven link chart I give you. The seven link chart is the chart I want you to work with. In the present time, I want you to stick with working with the seven link chart because it's applicable to your practice directly and it helps you the most in understanding what's going on in your life. So then you're, you're gonna be dealing with contact, right? And feeling, which we talk about in terms of, you, you, don't, you, you are not your sense door and you don't control your sense door. It's not my sight, my hearing would mean I control what I hear and I control what I see. So that he's trying to get you used to the idea. It's the I not my eye, it is not me, it is not my, not myself, the ear, not me, not mine, not myself, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the five of those sense doors are your experience in this life, in this existence, okay, external experience. Mind is the one that's inside and for the, to be able to watch the very beginning of this arising and how it all works. That's why we watch inside. So he's using that, a different formation or order of things in this particular sutta, but it doesn't mean that it disagrees with the other suttas that have different numbers and lengths. I get really, <laughs> I like to sit and smile and I almost laugh when, I run into monks that are having this argument that the Buddha is just, why is he so inaccurate? Why does he disagree with himself when he, he talks about dependent origination? And why does he do this? Why does he use five links, seven links, nine links, 11 links? And as soon as you know 12 by heart, why does your teacher tell you there's 24? <laughs> That's what Bhante did to me when I went there and I said, oh, I, I knocked on the door, you know, you know, and he comes to the door and he says, what? And I said, I know all 12. Ah, I said, recite them. And I did recite them. And then he says, okay, just a minute. He goes away and he comes back and he has some, um, where's one of these? He has uh, tiny little pamphlets. I, I don't have one right here. They're tiny little pamphlets like wheel publications. And he hands it to me and he says, okay, now there's 24. Go, go, go back to work. <laughs> he sends me back. What he's talking about is the transitional system or transformation, transcendence or transformation, those two words. Someone came one time and said, you know, we don't transcend anything in, in Buddhism. I was surprised. We don't transform. And I'm there, we don't? Because <laughs> I thought, wow, it transformed my life completely, completely changed me, you know? I went from thinking the whole world was on top of me to understanding nothing is happening to me and there doesn't have to be a weight on my head. I came out to finally understand nothing is happening to you in life. Everything is happening from you. What that means is your opinion when anything happens, your perspective. If you're taking it personally, boy, that's like putting more weight on the weight on your head and saying the whole world is on it. And Atlas, the Greek story, holding up the world, it must have been horrible. <laughs> I mean, everybody, the weight of everything, thinking he had to fix everything. But it's not that difficult. So these different, different pieces in the different suttas are not contrary to each other at all. You have where you're explaining a particular feeling, and then you get another one where you're trying to explain specifically the reactions and how they work and the emotions, how they are different from feelings. You have different numbers of links you're working with. Hypothetically, in the meditation school that he, was, he had set up, everybody had to learn the 12 and understand them in a simple way and know them. That's why we teach you Sutta number 38, and we go back and mess up your mind with suit number 18. Because <laughs> as soon as you figure out clinging, then you go back there and it's called mental proliferation. And you're, you're all screaming, but where's the clinging? You know, well, 
they defined the clinging as all the stories and ideas and imaginations and everything that run around in your mind, like runaway mind, runaway thinking. When contact happens as conditioned feeling arises, when feeling is there as condition, craving arises, and that's, I don't like this. And then right after that, bang, we're in Upadana and clinging and clinging is the story that why you don't like it and it's running and like a monkey in your head and that's clinging and then clinging tumbles over into into your brain choosing something in bawa that is from the past i mean 99.9 percent .9 of the time it's from the past and it's similar to whatever is going on right now and so your reaction is going to be born any second as a result of that play that was called i don't know but barbara streisand was in there they play it again sam play it again sam is, is the line in the song and you just keep looping you loop and you no, know, if anything happens that is similar to what's happening at that point in your life, again, you're going to loop and take the same loop and react again, react again, react again. That's the problem in the world, isn't it? That's why we can't seem to come up with new possibilities because things remind us of what has happened in the past and we're so caught on what on the fact that everybody must be basically stupid and they're just going to keep doing it again and again. So don't get excited when they say there's going to be a peace talk and don't go quitting and don't go to work because you got to watch a peace talk because they're all going to sit around the table and they're going to smile and wave to you. We're going into the peace talk. Yay. And the kids are going to tell you, oh, mom, they're going into the peace talk. There's going to be a peace. We're so excited. Oh my gosh. And why is it that peace talk doesn't work? Because they should first sit there and learn dependent origination before they do the peace talk. Then maybe they would understand what was really happening. And I just don't believe we're stuck. I believe someday we're going to hear about how people are not stuck just sitting there. And, you know, Everett has the solution. He came to the peace talk. He came and he prepared his dossier. And Everett sat down and he said, look, I just need five minutes. I, I have peace for the world. I can show you how to do it. It's really simple. <laughs> Don't fight anymore. <laughs> you know, you know it's, put those guns away. <laughs> you know, take away all the tanks they play with. And, they, and there's running around with little trucks that are not little anymore that have these things that shoot each other. Stop it. Get out of the sandbox, come back to the world and just stop. And, you know, May's going to have a new project. She's going to invent a business where she can collect all the stuff and try to fill a sinkhole. That's what she told me. In Russia, there's one of the deepest sinkholes in the world. If they just send all the tanks and all the missiles and everything to her, she can dump them in the sinkhole. I understand it has no bottom and there's plenty of space for all. Just think about it. What would it be like? And the people in, we're dancing round and round and singing all the peace song and the guns and the missiles and the uniforms were sitting there on the ground. You know, last night I had a famous dream. It's an old song. And it describes the whole thing. And everybody just put their guns down, came home, and they all said, no more. There's not going to be any war anymore. Somehow these brains have got to have room in them to understand there is a possibility where everybody has the same spot in their brain somewhere where they can discover what it feels like to not even have to think that there is anything anywhere in this world anymore that could hurt somebody there could be peace in the world and if we all stopped fighting hmm, what might happen it would be interesting anyway i shouldn't do this i'm probably breaking some governmental law about you're not supposed to talk about this sort of stuff because it's about peace and it doesn't make money or something i don't know <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not sure. Does it make enough money? Okay. Anyway, I believe human beings are potentially have a, enough of a brain. They've got more than a monkey. I mean, <laughs> they don't mind. I think they've got enough of a brain that they would be able to figure this out. And I really thought by the year 2000, they would. Well, I was mistaken, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's keep reading. <laughs> okay. So he looks at these pieces and he says, he may not regard form as self, but he regards self as possessed possessing form and that regarding is a formation in his mind and we don't read this whole thing this whole section here again the point is when one knows and sees this monks the immediate destruction of the taint occurs this is what the buddha said if you and what he's saying is if you don't consider itself if you're not preoccupied with what has always happened before, you know, that's a formation. They go into the peace conference, they have this in their head. Let's see, do, did we give you the list? Did you memorize what will the Russians do? What will the Syrians do? What will the Israelis do? What will the Germans do? What will the English do? What will the people on Corsica do? What will everybody do? As you go in, you pre pre programmed like this. So when anybody expects to present anything, if it takes one day or one week, there's always going to be somebody in there say, yeah, but you can't do that. Why? Why? It's a good idea. You, know, you can't do it. Why? Because they always do this and they always do that. And you know, you always do that. <laughs> Yes, I don't know. I think it's that they cut down on how many children people could have. And that was the problem. When you cut down on how many children you can have, because when you get to six children, you know, when you get to six, five or six kids running around, you have to sit down and, and teach them how to have a meeting once in a while. So they all get along and they don't fight. But if you only have one or one and a half, I like the countries where they said you can have 1.5 kids. I've never been able to figure that out. You know, some country, what, what, what is the 0.5 kid? The short one. Shh, don't do that. This is that's not woke, not waking up here. Okay. But what is 1.5 children? Come on. And they actually put these in tables. I've seen them. <clears throat> okay. It's somebody who didn't want to get to two, like the man that never wanted to get to five. <laughs> okay. So here, he may not regard form as self or self as possessing form, but he regards form as in self. So they twist this around and say, you, you think this is, this is a good point. It's an example of when I want you to learn the Dhamma, then I want you to know the Dhamma, and then I want you to internalize it, then I want you to live it all the time. I mean, it's not a big request, really. <laughs> so how am I talking to you about that? Well, if you learn to define something, and you read it, okay, and we give you a definition, then I want you to go and sit and see if you can see that part happening in something that's going on in your life, not necessarily sitting, well, sitting in the office, you know, you know, not necessarily sitting in meditation, but sitting in the office. Can you see the situation that's going on between Mac and Martha and whatever, or Mac and Jerry or whoever is there and they're having a problem working together? Can you see what's happening? Can you see the dependent origination? Because that's how well I want you to understand it. Can you go through an event in life where you stop for a moment and say, wait a minute, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself, but I can stand here with equanimity and I can listen to this and I can watch it and I can see how it's all working. It gets really interesting when you're able to do that in a big office with cubicles, you know, what do you think those supervisors in the offices are doing when they have 80 people in a room and they're sitting in cubicles? They're sitting up higher and they're looking down in the cubicles. And they're, what are they, you know? They, 
you can see how this is working. And the other thing I made somebody really mad once because I said you could watch a horse or watch a dog or watch a cat with dependent origination. That's not possible. Why? Of course it is. Oh my goodness. So obviously they're not close enough. They haven't got it ingrained. So you hear it. And the Chinese were very good about this. I, I went to the elementary school in uh, the Republic of China in Taiwan. I was, my house was on the, next to the playing field. So I went over to ask them if I could sit in some of the classrooms. And the little notes are on the door of each classroom where the kids are. I said to the woman who was with me, what does it mean? What are the, why are these notes on all the doors? Is it an announcement or something? And um, she said, no, it's a, it's, a, it's kind of a lesson. They have to memorize it. In order to learn something, you, you have to see it. You have to hear the teacher saying it. You have to see her writing it on the board. Um, you have to write it down and you have to say it and then you know it. So it's like, it's like hearing it and seeing it and writing it and saying it. And then you know it, you can say, I know that one. Now you can go to the next piece. And actually that was very accurate. And it, it's a way that people learn things for tests and it's one of the reasons they're so incredibly smart, some of these kids, because they've got it down pat and they learned it in elementary school. Now, if we could just make them ask questions too, we'd be in good shape. <laughs> but you can't have everything. But this is a really good thing to have, okay? Okay, he may not regard self form as self or self as possessing form, or form in the self, but he regards self as in the form. And that regarding is a formation. So he's trying to get you to understand you're moving towards letting go of formations completely in this whole thing. That's what he's trying to do. That's why uh, Delson likes to talk about like the path. And I really like this instead of saying Jana. Is, it is a level of understanding. If you look at the charts that David put in his book and you look at the description of each one of the jhanas as it's going down, down, down in each one, it is um, the definition of what's, what's happening now and what's not happening anymore. It's that way, it's true. But also he calls it the levels of cessation as you're going down the path. And I like that. Because where are you going? And after all, um, when I draw the little guy, I call him Freddy. <laughs> you know, it, it used to irritate Bond. <laughs> he don't like Freddy. But I mean, Freddy made a point. You know, and he has this much tension in his head. And if you're practicing right effort correctly, when you have this much tension in your head and you have a, a, a um, hindrance come up, then you recognize the tension is pressing there. And so you let go of the thought of the hindrance and you relax and smile and come back. So this step, relax, smile and come back. What's, why is it so important? Because in the original instructions, which were the best ones that we have, um, you know, preserved in the Anapanasati Sutta in Majjhima Nikaya number 118, you have the two paragraphs and in, on the in-breath, tranquilize the bodily formation. And then on the next paragraph, it's talking about on the in-breath and on the out-breath, tranquilize the mental formation. So he's getting you to be aware of your body, aware of your mind. And eventually you figure out if you relax your mind, your body follows. That's something that you learn as you're practicing later on. But he's, you see the cessation every time you let go it goes a tiny bit down, but then when you relax, it goes a little bit more down. So now you're working, Freddie was working from here. So if he's pulled away now and he has to let go, okay, re and release it and then relax, he comes down a little bit more. So why is that so important? Why? Because cessation, uh, the cessation state that you fall into, the neurota state, way down there in neither perception or non-perception, when you finally are able to fall over, you're falling over because you're just not there anymore. You're not thinking about formations at all anymore, at all. 
you have let go, let go, let go. So it's been a renunciation and abandonment, a letting go constantly as you're going down the path. And if you're practicing right effort correctly, you're letting go of your attention on the uh, hindrance, and then you're relaxing and smiling what the smiling is doing. It's making your mind immediately lighter. And it also makes your awareness sharper. They have all these things they can wire you up now and they can say, oh, look there, that got sharper and this got uh, this and this did that, you know, and they used to start with these caps, you know, for people in research and they had like 12 pieces on them and the ones you can buy that you can hook up. I think they have five pieces on them or something like five. Okay. But when you look at what Delson had on his head when he was doing research in Amsterdam, they're up to like something like 38 little things on this thing cap, you know, kind of reminds me of a blonde who's touching up the end when the, she's doing, you know, they put the, they, <laughs> do you remember this, but in the sixties, they put the, they put the uh, aluminum foil on the, on all the hair all over the whole entire head. And they had like about 50 to 70 folded pieces of aluminum. And then they touched up the ends the tips and the person looked like they had like a uh, light in their hair. It was beautiful. If it was done correctly, it was really beautiful. If it wasn't done correctly, you went for a swim and it turned green. <laughs> that was Clarol, Miss Clarol. Everybody knows Miss Clarol because what Miss Clarol told you all about being blonde in the sixties, what she didn't say was, and don't go swimming. <laughs> in the pool anymore because the chlorine turns our product green or purple <laughs> it's really wonderful they got over that it's better now <laughs> but you know, obviously i don't have to worry about that so. okay so he may not regard form as self or self as in form but he regards the feeling as self so now what they're going to take you in the sutta is it's not just um, not just the feeling that it's not just that you have to worry about just forms, but it's the forms with body. So body now is going to take you body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. It's that too. And so if you get to the point where you understand, you let go, let go, let go, let go, let go, let it go, let it go. Let it go. And somebody said, can you do that musically? I said, yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't study opera for nothing. I'm saying, yes. You see? There you go. Do it on a trumpet. It's really fun. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're looking at it has to be considered from the body perspective, from feeling perspective, from perception, perceiving. The moment you perceive, don't grab into that's my idea, my perception, my perceiving this, my naming this. You have to let go of all of it. So that's why when we're talking to you about your meditation, where somebody says, well, what am I supposed to be doing? I'm not supposed to be there <laughs> at all. I can go on a vacation. <laughs> and the Mexicans, they don't like it because I, yai, 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 sing and be happy. <laughs> I, 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 oh, I got Everett is smiling. He's smiling. Careful, Everett. <laughs> I'm teasing you. We need to get Everett smiling more. We got him. Okay. This is, they put the Mexican hat on the floor. They dance around the big hat. It's ay, 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 yeah. You're not allowed to do that if you're Buddhist. Okay. So be careful. Okay. So perception. Okay. Volition is uh, formations, uh, the volitional formations, and then uh, consciousness. Body, feeling, perception, thoughts, volitional formations is equivalent to thoughts. Okay. Um, so what we see is they're talking about going down the path here, and they're talking about releasing the idea completely that it's me, it's mine, it's myself. 
I was just reading a book yesterday, um, somebody wrote, and they were going along fine until all of a sudden, oh, it's right here. I can tell you what happened. I, I marked it in here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was fine until it got to this part about um, uh, when describes impermanence uh, because at the base of it all, the Buddha is really showing us what happens so we can see both um, that which arises is impermanent and how to, now listen carefully, and how to keep it from happening in the first place. So this person was writing along about this whole thing without any Atta involved in it, very innocently describing everything perfectly. And all of a sudden, here I am, <laughs> you know, and I have to stop this. It's, it's still, you know, this, this is happening in my practice. Until now, I have to look at how to keep it from happening in the first place, and then the next place, therefore proving its impermanence when we put a stop to it. You got that? That means I just arrived at the party. <laughs> okay, that's what that means. And I was frustrated because everything was going along so fine when I'm reading this thing and I'm thinking this is really good ideas. And all of a sudden I showed up at the party and now I have to make something happen or I have to stop something or control something. So the, not to mention that the Atta and Anatta were backwards. So Anatta was the whole problem. And I'm there, whoa, what happened on this page? And I have to write this person and say, please tell me how this is, is it actually printed wrong? Or was it, how did it get reversed? How did it get mixed up? And there's a whole page now. And I'm there like, I have 25 pages left to finish this thing. And I'm there, but wait a second, uh, what happened? I thought that was so clear. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> wow, Anatta is the problem. <laughs> and I'm there, no. And this has happened before. This is a very interesting thing. Because, you know, for many years, I didn't even think about it. You have a Nietzsche, Dukkha, and Anatta. And I think I told you before, I said to you that Anatta is our, I mean, Anicca is our friend. And we should be respectful of it. Most of the places you read things being written about by about Buddhism, you hear Anicca is the whole problem. It is the unsatisfactoriness. It's the definition of suffering caused by change. And human beings do not like change. Since they do not like change, and change is equivalent to impermanence, and impermanence is a problem. Therefore, it is a cause of suffering. Now, People who have just been through an awful thing in a war and have to be thrown out of their homeland and go someplace are thinking change really blew it for us. You see, of course, it's the devil incarnate and they, it's just killing everybody's mind because change abruptly came. And I, I still, in my head, in the Ukrainian thing, I still have this picture of this woman talking to a reporter two days or three days before everything blew up, saying our country's beautiful, we have a beautiful um, you know, gross national product, we have successful city here and everything's beautiful, nothing's happening, nothing's wrong at all. And she left and went shopping. I don't know if she survived it, but three days later, that whole area was gone, it just rubble. You see, that's change. So we can, sort of put the damnation on the word Nietzsche and hate it. And, but remember, it's very innocent. And because it's a universal law that everything is impermanent. And then we come to the student who had the problem with the family where everybody was fighting and they're all living in the same house. <laughs> Okay. And she comes down the stairs and she's practicing and everything. And all of a sudden she realizes she has enough equanimity. She doesn't have to walk in the room where this is going on. And she sees the whole thing like it's a movie in front of her and everything is happening like that. But now all of a sudden, this is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. This is just a movie. And I don't have to walk into that movie. 
And then I reflect on the 1960s when things were not going well in my family, you know, and some people were yelling really profoundly at other people. And I would get on the phone with one of them far away and they'd be screaming. And then I'd start screaming on the phone. <laughs> and, and years later, I become a Buddhist. And, you know, I found out something. I could have hung up the phone. <laughs> I never thought of it. In those days when I was younger, I never thought about I can hang up the phone. So before you throw yourself in desperation, if you're going through a divorce or if you're going through life in a really rough and tumble way and you're on the phone, please remember you can turn it off. And just write a note to the family. If you scream at me, I'm just going to turn the phone off. So just all of you remember that. That's all. And if you all want to talk. Well, y'all come down here and we'll have apple pie and we'll talk, you know, but don't be screaming at me anymore. And it, oh, the truth is, put the phone down. Yes, put the phone down. You see? So this is part of what this is about. And you know, your whole life will change. If you begin to understand, you don't have to take things personally. And I told you the... The, the part about the hindrance for my next occupation someday, I'm going to be a lawyer and I'm going to take the hindrance to court and defend it because the hindrances are innocent. They are innocent. And all of this comes back to this other page here where your perspective is determining. What is it determining? What you think and ponder on, that becomes the inclination of your mind. The inclination of your mind comes from a thought. First, the, first the thought pops up, immediate pers perspective, your immediate perspective. Oh, they're trying to come and get me. <laughs> That's your immediate perspective. They're coming to get me. I got to defend myself. So a personal perspective is an atta perspective. And an anatta perspective is this is me, not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. Try it for a day with everything that happens. Everything. When they won't let you park in the street, <laughs> when you're behind 150 trucks and have to wait 25 minutes just to get to the bridge or something, you know, <laughs> and all these things that happen during the day. You don't have enough pencils. You, you ran out of pens. And honestly, you thought you had 20 in your pocketbook, but somebody dumped it out and took them, the kids probably, and you don't have any left. <laughs> and, it all, and you're so annoyed and you start laughing at this whole thing. Don't take anything personally. And somebody said to me, Sister Kama, you are asking us all to teach the same way, but you are guilty because you changed the six R's. Oh, I'm sorry. What did I do? First of all, you told us to just say, never mind. Well, I told you to say, as you saw the hindrance, as you notice the hindrance, you say in your mind, never mind when you really, as you're releasing it, you go, never mind. And I told you here, we say, Zaudia. <laughs> and all the countries, all the languages, I'm, I'm by the way, I'm probably going to, to the Czech Republic. Now I'm not going to Poland. I'm going to the Czech Republic. Oh, why aren't you going to Poland, Sister Kim? Because that's where everybody from the Ukraine went. <laughs> and there's no place to rent at all in Gdansk right now. We cannot even find, I don't even know if you could get a hotel room in Gdansk because the government is paying people to take people in and give them a place to live. And they're paying a rent, the a subsidy to the family. So everything is rented everywhere. So, so they searched around and they found a couple cities. They looked at Krakow and then they went, they went and looked in Krakow was 50, 50, you know, but uh, Prague is empty. So they, we thought, Oh, Prague is interesting. Okay. So also Prague is interesting for another reason. Prague is interesting because it has a lot of retreat centers and they're not very busy right now, but Maybe in the next couple of months, we'd be able to have that low as well. So that's what they think they're going to do now. 
but they they already went over there and i did get my visa hallelujah hallelujah <laughs> and and probably print it in two days it takes a couple of days to come through the computer computer it's like I don't know why it's taking a couple of days to come through, but after you pay for the renewal, then they have to take two or three days to trickle down to where it comes in your computer. And then once I have that, I can go and I will be over there for um, the rest of May, however left of May we have. I, you know, I think in the next six days we're looking at probably I'll be over there. And then we have all of June, all of July, we want to have a retreat near the end that's open to anybody, but we're trying to cluster these retreats like small ones with 10 people in each one of these different folks that have clients and they want and they have employees or they have clients. And those are the people who are coming first and they are involved with the coaches, different coaches, these international coaches who are helping these people start their businesses or run their businesses and stuff. And they want to take the program into their program and get TWIM all over the world. That's all. I mean, I only wanted to, you know, I sat there and said, what can I do for the last next 10 years? And I thought maybe India, but, you know, somebody said, why not the whole world? <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> you know? So we'll do, we'll do this. And if they set up a center for me to escape to during the hot season, from now on, I will leave April, May, June, July. If I can figure out how to do that, it all comes down to the renewal on the visa. <laughs> when we start that in March and get it done, then I can go out and not go through what I had my own special version of suffering, like walking 10 feet and having to change my clothes. <laughs> you know, it was like, I'm just not built in my 70s for... 115 degrees or 110 degrees Fahrenheit on a steady basis, you see? So even walking outside to hang up the wash and come back in means I have to take my clothes off and have a shower. And, and nobody else on the street is having this problem. <laughs> it's just uh, this person who has no protection system operating anymore in my 70s. And it's just part of getting older. That's the way I see it. Doesn't mean I'm stopping. Nope, it doesn't. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's come back to earth here, Sister Cayman. Come down for a landing. Okay. Um, so body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. The whole issue is not to take self as in consciousness or consciousness as self or self as in consciousness and all these little things, you think about them one by one and you look at them and figure out what they mean to you. Because these are all the ways they're still stuck in there. So you could give up thinking about consciousness as self, but you might still have self in your consciousness. Do you see how, well, I was talking to you a while ago about the little postcards on the doors about how to learn these four different ways to get the whole thing so you can say, I learned that. Mm -hmm. You heard the teacher say it, you saw her write it on the board, you wrote it on your notes, and then you said it out loud, and then maybe you got through one layer of this, but you still have layers to go to get it inside you so it's absolutely there when you take an exam and you get an A. That's how it works. And self as in the consciousness, or, uh, and then regarding uh, the regarding that, that regarding is a formation, just the what's left inside that as you're regarding it is a formation. So even when you think you're not forming anything, you're still forming stuff. So the student comes to you and says, okay, why do I have to sit longer? Because the longer that you sit, the more able you are, you able, you, it's your, about your ability to see what's going on inside in the smaller part of everything inside yourself. And if you just, can, you can't sit long until you start letting it all go, just letting it go. And that's why when all of a sudden someone says, but we have to control it, we have to make it stop, it's wrong. Because that uh, obviously, why was it wrong to say that on when I mentioned to you was because nutriment was not identified. Nutriment was thought of a different way. 
but nutriment was actually the paying attention to something that's coming up is causing the problem, the personal paying attention to it. And that's Atta, not Anatta, but that's Atta. And then coming back to this, I tried to get there, but I missed, okay? You have the three characteristics, Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. And I always thought Anicca was bad, but remember it's not. Anicca is our friend because it means stuff will come to an end. So why get upset about it? Because if you wait 10 minutes, it's all going to change. There you go. Okay, so Anicca, Dukkha, we know what the Dukkha is, the suffering. It's the physical and the mental suffering. Okay, different, the two kinds of suffering. It's all you need to worry about. Okay, and then anatta is, it's the way out. But if you get the impression, I had the impression anatta was hooked on there and it was a problem too. I didn't understand for a long time. And all, all of a sudden, oh, that's what this is. You know what tripped it off for me? In Angutra Nikaya, in the book of threes, and the sutta is 125, you're going to find in that sutta, I teach a dhamma. Let's see, I teach a dhamma. I do not teach a dhamma without a basis. I do not teach a dhamma without knowledge. I do not teach a, a, a dhamma that is antidotal. That's the first statement. The second one that follows it is I teach a Dhamma with a basis, a block of information, he means, that is secure that I found and figured out very precise. And that's what we're trying to show you. There was this little block of information. So I teach a Dhamma with this basis. I teach a, a Dhamma with a set of knowledge. That's what we're talking about here, a set of knowledge about how things work. And I teach a Dhamma with a uh, that is not antidotal, it has an antidote. So in that, that particular one, it's these three pieces and it's showing you it's, it, there's an antidote. And when I saw those three were set up that way, I looked at the characteristics and my mind went, oh, Anicca and Dukkha can be a problem, but Anatta is the way out, the Anatta. You see, so all those three pieces are not all part of the problem. They are just, you have to fully understand and niche it on both sides, that it can be your friend or it can be your irritant, but it's only your irritant if you forget what it meant. <laughs> Isn't that true? Yeah, it can only be irritating for you if you forget what a, not a Nietzsche is. A Nietzsche means impermanent and it means nothing, it, everything is changing all the time. So you don't like that. So it made you uncomfortable. So maybe you did get married like me and move like 19 times in 10 years. <laughs> you know, it just uh, it was kind of an okay. <laughs> but but the thing is, we, we ended up taking those kind of as gliding through them. In other words, the thing you do first when you set up the next place is you put the bureau in there and open up the drawer. And if you don't have the bed for the kids, you put them in the drawer. <laughs> You put a blanket in the drawer and you put the baby in there and then you keep setting up the house. It's simple. <laughs> you know, we, lots of the wives used to talk about all of this together. You know, what do you do first? Oh, I'm in agony because the last room that my husband wants to let me take out of the box and set up is, is the, uh, they want, I always set up our room first, she'll say. And then she's miserable for the whole entire moving process because that's a big mistake. When you move a family, you set up the children's room first and make sure that they're gonna take a nap in the room while you're, you're coming in and building this place for them. You do the children's room first. This is vital. I used to teach people how to move. <laughs> you know, I knew you use that information for something. But that's why, because then the, the baby is not, where is my room? And what am I gonna do? And where's my teddy bear? No, it's all unpacked first. Then you do the rest of the house so you can cook when they wake up. And then you go to sleep in your room in the end. And you might end up on the floor that night. That's fine. But that's the best way to do it. So it's an order to things. And in Buddhism, oh boy, you bet there's an order. There's an order to each one of these groups that exists. But then Sister King comes along and, and, and Bhandi comes along and he starts going, okay, here's a needle. 
let's start working and you sew them all together you see and you end up with this tapestry where they're all part of this tapestry hanging on the wall and they're all there all these systems are there but they're all sewn together they are not just over like this to study in a disconnected way they're they're combined so it matters when you look at um the idea of anatta which is what this is about it's not myself it's not me it's not mine it's not myself this is is an anatta practice it matters when you're learning this stuff to get yourself in that frame of mind so how do i change things when i'm giving you the instructions you try this one no matter what happens tomorrow you forgive it forgive it first just i forgive it immediately i forgive it no matter what happens the water didn't come on <laughs> you know but i forgive it and just remember anicca you should have your little flags on the wall by now you know the little team flag that says anicca <laughs> you know and have anicca all over the place if you start to get irritated you go anicca <laughs> you know just remember anicca is the way out of everything because it's not going to it's not going to be permanently there okay so you forgive it at the front door so you forgive it you apply compassion why compassion sister came out because we said that compassion is for yourself in this case you're the one with the painful feeling and it's um and it's uh getting you down and um so the, we said the definition of compassion is what this is about. You see a person in pain. That's number one. Number two, you remember the knowledge that that person's pain is their pain. It is not yours. And you cannot take that pain away. That's the second piece. The third step is you give them this. You can help them figure out how to have the space they need to go through their pain. You know, if somebody's really crying because their boyfriend just left them you, you don't shut the door and say i'm sorry nobody can come in my house that's crying go home and shut the door <laughs> no. you let them come in and sit okay now you know it's their pain and you can't take it away from them and they get a big problem okay but you can let them sit there and give them a cup of water and you can just listen you don't have to tell them how to do anything just be there for them and listen and make sure they get something to eat and make sure they get something to drink. Yeah. And they tell the story five times in a row to you, or maybe six times, maybe seven times. <laughs> I was counseling somebody. Oh, she, I, she's a good, she's a good one. So I mean, I'm, I was counseling somebody about something. Okay. And they were coming. Uh, I don't have to tell you who it is or anything. It just was really fun because I was just listening and listening and listening. And she came over and she told me the situation from the beginning to the end, where she was stuck from the beginning to the end, at least five, six, seven times in a row. And I told her, I said, look, don't ever feel bad about this. She said, oh, I did that. I said, but don't, don't feel bad about that. I made her feel better. Years ago, I had something really terrible happen. And I just wanted to tell the story. <laughs> and nobody was there to tell it to and the neighbors were all on vacation everybody was gone i couldn't even go next door and have coffee and tell it to somebody so i decided to go shopping and i went shopping and i went into this little mall where there was a shoe store and nobody was there i when it was i don't remember what the holiday was but just nobody was around it wasn't where everybody went shopping it's more like they all went to the mountains or something and i went in the shoe store and the man the the shoe salesman is in there so it was a hush puppy store and i i love hush puppies so i started looking at them and i he got four or five boxes different styles and different sizes for me and he sat in front of me on the floor and he's putting the shoes on and off and i'm telling him the story and telling him the story and i'm telling him the story for about 45 minutes and i'm feeling a lot better because i'm telling the story and he's going yep 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 and i said i still feel guilty to this day because when i was finished telling the story for the fifth time i left and the saddest part is i didn't buy any shoes <laughs> and then 
this is years and years and years ago, but it comes up in my mind. I didn't buy the shoes. I still feel guilty. I don't know if he's still alive or not. But the point was, she. I told her that story. And, I, and when she started to tell me again, I said, no, nah, remember the shoe salesman. <laughs> so now it's like, just remember the shoe salesman is waiting for you to come. You know, if the if the store is empty and he has nothing to do and you, life is terrible, you just go and sit down with the shoe salesman. But please, if you do that, if you ever do that, please at least buy a pair of slippers, <laughs> even if you don't buy a pair of shoes, or at least buy a pair of socks for heaven's sakes. You know, they have socks in the store. Buy a pair of socks. Okay, coming back to this, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself, which was her lesson, okay, <laughs> and it's going to be, and very much a Nietzsche, it will come to an end, and you know, it did a time later, and so these things are not going to be there forever, if you understand the anatomy of how they're happening, they don't have to be caught inside you forever, yeah, you don't have to be Atlas and carry the world on your shoulder. And so when one knows and sees thus, the immediate destruction of the taints occurs if you're willing to say, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. And it goes on and says, he may regard the form and go through the form as self or self as in consciousness, uh, it, or, but he holds such a view as this, that which is the self is the world having passed away that I shall be impermanent, stable, eternal, not subject to change. If you have these kinds of views, you're, an etern you're locked in eternalism. And you're, you're, when one knows and sees this way, the immediate destruction of the taints occurs. When you're looking at it clearly and you understand how to balance it against that, then it means that they can occur, but he may not regard form as self or hold such an eternalistic view. He holds such a view as this. I might not be, and it might not be for me. I will not be, and it will not be for me. The annihilationist view is the formation. So eternalism, the extreme there, or the eternalism, uh, or, or the other point of this is it, life is this, the die, that, that's it, nothing more. There's nothing more at all. It's absolutely the uh, end of everything. Well, then he goes, he may not regard for himself or hold such uh, annihilationist view, but he is perplexed. He's doubtful, indecisive in regard to the true Dhamma. The perplexity, the doubtfulness, the indecisiveness in regards to the true Dhamma is a formation as well, a formation in the mind. So he's talking about what particular things stick in your mind that you're holding on to and you're thinking it's all about me and I have to figure this out and I can't examine this or test it or anything because it's part of me and you stop with everything. The formation, what is its source? What is its origin? From what is it born and produced? Where is it coming from? You know, sometimes we'll say um, the question. Bonte will give the student the question and say, you, it's time for you to ask the question. When you sit down, why is it that I can only sit for 30 minutes? Why is it, what is it? what is happening that makes it so that I can sit and you just trust your intuition it will come up and then if you're caught and you can't go more than 30 minutes you look at you decide you make a personal decision I'm going to sit for 10 when you sit down the next time I'm going to sit for 10 minutes longer ah then you start playing with the little brain, the little mind. He <laughs> said, when you get to the end of that 10 minutes, I'm going to sit for just 10 minutes more. And now you just did 20 minutes more. You try to do that. See, I tell people the best way to work with mind is to remember it's like a two-year-old, <laughs> just a two-year-old child. It's like a little two-year-old and you've got to play with it. Don't try to order it around. Just say, I got to control my mind. <laughs> 
I gotta stop the world from turning. No, don't do that, you know? Treat it more like a child. Listen, just let's, let's play it this way this time. When I sit, I'm gonna sit for 30 minutes, okay? And then I'm gonna sit for 40 minutes. And then I'm gonna sit. I did that with one retreat. Everybody was doing exactly what I told them. And they just went from 30 minutes to three hours in 10 days. This was amazing. We were doing it in 10 minute increments. I thought, I wonder what would happen if I did it in 20 minute increments in the half hour increments for some of them. And they were just doing what they were asked to do. And then after the retreat, I said, I wonder if it's going to stick. I wonder if they're going to keep doing this. And a month later, I checked in. All but two of them were just still doing these long sits that they had developed. They're still using it. So they figured out where they were getting stuck. They figured out how to let go and just be and sit and watch. But you're, you're using the Four Noble Truths in this constantly through here. What is the source? What is the origin from where? What is it? Um, from what is it being born and produced? You're talking about the links that come before. And you can see this one is not me. It's not mine. It's not myself. And that one is not me, not mine, my, my, myself. You are innocent not to get distressed it's all naturally happening and when the uninstructed worldling is contacted by a feeling born of ignorance and contact craving arises and thence that formation is born so the format that formation is impermanent it is conditioned dependently arisen nothing happens anywhere without dependent erot co-arising the dependent co-arising this is what is so fantastic about dependent origination understand nothing is like that the craving is impermanent it is conditioned dependently arisen feeling is impermanent and conditioned and depend dependently arisen contact is per impermanent and it's conditioned and it's dependently arisen and that ignorance is impermanent conditioned and dependently arisen when one knows and sees how everything is working the immediate destruction of the taints occurs so this is the end of this little sutta so questions to any of these little silly stories I told you, but I'm just telling you these little silly stories because they're ways to remember stuff. You are powerful. Some people come into meditation feeling lost and I'm just not powerful and I can't, I can't, I have no power at all. Let me tell you something. The world is walking around out there and they don't know any of the stuff we're talking about. And you have such a tremendous edge on everything if you understand how things are working. And it's so powerful that when you go back in the Majjhima Nikaya, I told you about that statement at the end of the Upakalesa Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya number 128, just the way it is framed in the last paragraph. And he goes through the 11 different types of hindrances. And what does he say? He says, I saw, Anaruta, I saw the, that this doubt was an imperfection of mine, and so I abandoned it. That's all he says. He abandons it the moment he sees it's an imperfection, and imperfection is something you think it's a blockage, it's going to stop you, but once you learn that this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself, you understand that the hindrance, and, and you know what the hindrance eats for food. It eats your attention. And if you pay attention to the hindrance, it will get bigger, it will get stronger, and it will come back, it'll be, it'll stay longer. Because you fed it, and so will the bear, <laughs> and so will the raccoon, and so will the skunk. You know, they're all going to come back to the cabin and be there on the back porch tomorrow at three o'clock in the afternoon. If you dump the lunch garbage out there, they're going to come to get it, you see, because you're giving them nutriment. Well, the hindrance behaves the same way. I, I once was called by my uncle 
came screaming in the house. Actually, he was riding a horse and he came, put the horse down at the barn with his daughter and he's coming up the house screaming, we got to go help Hazel. And what happened to Hazel? She just phoned me and the bear is in the house and she's caught in the bathroom. And what happened? <laughs> what happened is they went and got honey in the woods and they brought the honey back and they let, had it on the dining room table. And this time of year, these bears are waking up and the bear smelled the honey and she had just the door was open and she had gone into the bathroom and she tried to come out. There was the bear by the dining room table. And you talk about a mess in that house. It came to get that honey and he just ramshackled that place, you know, and she was just she just stayed in the bathroom. She didn't have any honey with her, <laughs> you know, it just stayed there until you got finished. But this is, he's, he's the hindrance, but all he really wants is food, food. Yeah. Okay, questions. Anybody? <laughs> questions? Hmm? Yes, I, I, I was uh, wondering, so, so um, a sutta like this, there, there are um, suttas like this, and is this sort of meant like a a recollection that, that you actively engage in, like hmm, uh, body. So let's think about the body in self, self in body. <clears throat> is that uh, is that the point of it, or is it, or is it more like as, as you or as I advance and or become more uh, or practice more, you start to see these things by themselves. <clears throat> You can see them by, your, by themselves inside the meditation, but it's also a skill training thing. So see, the school was set up, so they're not taking notes, but the school was set up in a way where their note system was their memorization system. So it's through reposition. That's one of the reasons the suttas are structured the way they're structured is because um, you keep do repeating it and repeating it and repeating it because it's a method of training, audiologically training, okay? And drilling and drilling and drilling until you just know, you know, the, the answer. And it's inside of you and it becomes part of you. And that's what he's after. Because then when you go out into the world and you start to practice, there's one of these that works with the six sense doors. There's lots of sutras that work based on the six sense doors. So I used to tell my beginner students, you know, please, you know, go outside and for the next week, take a day for each one of the sense doors. That's six days. Watch everything that you see and, and just think about it. Do I believe this is my sight and that it's, it is me when I see something? It is mine. And then how serious does it go? Is it myself that I could not see if I, unless I had was doing it? We used to play a game with that when I used to tell you, you know, okay, if you, so this is your site. Yes, it is my site. And I say, well, okay, then you go home tonight. Here's my phone number. I'll give you the phone number. <laughs> and when you wake up tomorrow, I want you to call me. And tell me if when you opened your eyes, you told your eye what to see before you opened up the eye and you, and you saw it only because you told the eye what to see. So if you don't realize that you don't understand that optical system is an anatomical part of the body and, the, and you have an optical, we always go eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body. And I started to go optical system auditory system, olfactory system, oral system, and the, the body system, physical body system, okay, of touch and, and feeling, you know, like this sort of thing, touching anything, experience of touch. And then the uh, mental system in the brain and the mind and all of that. And we, we don't do this normally in our growing up with our family get to a place where somebody says, well, before we go to the beach, the beach after lunch, you know, they say, before you go to the beach, you have your shovel. Yeah, okay, you have your bucket, good. Now let's remember this. And I go through the whole thing before they go to the beach. I never did that with my kids. <laughs> Everything that you see here, smell, taste, touch at the beach, just remember, it's not me, it's not mine, it's not myself, it's just here. It's, you're seeing what it is. Now go back into the, um, 
go back into what we do when we're in a retreat, you know, when we're in a retreat and the, in the morning, we have that one phrase that we get annoyed with Bonte. There's 246 or something different verses in, in the Dhammapada, but he wants to stick with these. And when I give you a lesson on these to really understand why does he want you to stick with these one, two, three, four, five couplets. So there's two verses in each one. So, you know, uh, he, he, the, because they have expressly important points, you need to drum them into your brain until it completely absorbs it and knows it. And one of those is in the unessential, we imagine the essential. In the essential, we see the unessential. And anyone who entertains such wrong thoughts as these never will realize the truth. What is essential, we regard as essential. What is unessential, we regard as unessential. And anyone who entertains such right thoughts will be able to realize the truth. So what is that couplet about? When you see something, how do you see it? Do you see it as this is what it is? This, it's only this. And you've heard Bunty in talks say fear, you know, or what's a good one? Uh, panic panic attacks. Okay. Um, believing panic attacks are me. They are mine and they are myself. They are who I am. And I am powerless over that. If that's true, powerless over that. But if you get the person, this is not me, this is not mine. This is not myself. This is just my body doing this thing. You know, it's just, but it's not me. I didn't say it's time to have a panic attack. And when you're suffering panic attacks, and you, you don't uh, take any, you believe that you're helpless in that situation. They get, they have drugs that they, that they'll give you to stop it from arising, but you never learn. You never learn the truth about the panic attack. The panic attack is not me. It is not mine. It is not myself. It is just a panic attack. You're talking to everybody about my panic attacks. How are your panic attacks? My panic attacks, but the panic attack syndrome the panic attack is they don't understand can be, it's all based coming, a lot of it's coming from the brain. And it, and it compounds very fast when it starts to happen, it flows through the body and then there's this fear. And the fear expands to, I'm gonna disturb May, I'm sitting between May and you, Everett's gonna go crazy because I'm gonna have a panic attack. And all of a sudden I'm going to be sitting here going, <laughs> And you're going to wonder, should I sit next to this person? What's happening next? You're, you're going to go crazy. So there's all this concern. We all have concerns for people around us when we're in a group. We don't just stand in a room with a bunch of people without having some concerns. Who's here? Who is that? What is that one going to do or this one going to do? Whether it's manners or how you eat or just all over the place. And when you have a panic attack, everything compounds very quickly because you feel you've been told because the drug companies have this drug, <laughs> the doctor doesn't say it that way, but that you're helpless. And so take this drug and take it and see how long it, you need to take it, but you'll never stop taking it. I know people that have taken those for years to maintain control that it never happens before you go out in a group of people or to a concert or anything like that. Okay, but you don't need that if you understand the structure of actually what's happening in terms of dependent origination with a panic attack. And if I gave you the charts, I gave you the worksheet and go carefully look at the panic attack line and tell me what happens with contact. Did you see something? Did you hear something, smell something, touch something, taste something that sets it off? Okay. And then when it gets, it starts moving, the contact, the feeling comes up. And for you, it's a painful feeling when it comes up. And very quickly, I don't like this. I don't like this. And you're, you're jumping to the conclusion of why you don't like it. Because when it happens, when I'm around people and I better not go around people anymore and I'm going to disturb people and my mother's going to get mad at me and my grandma is going to go crazy. And what am I going to do? Oh my God, it's here. You see, that's where you are with this thing. And it's happening. And while you're going through that, you're soaking wet from your neck all the way down through, you see? But you have to remember Anicca. 
<laughs> whatever arises is going to pass away and re you could relax a little even if you only had a, the story about a Nietzsche you would relax a little bit and say don't worry this is going to get over we we'll just go out to the car and drive home and change clothes and come back again <laughs> you see or them until you get used to the fact that this doesn't own you these events these things that happen they don't own you they are just what they are you see they're not me they're not mine they're not myself the lesson is an extraordinary lesson if you go out and expand it to examine it more closely now the monks were able to do that because they were all listened to one sutta the night before and when they get up and they're walking alms, they're watching the effects of that sutta they heard the night before. When they come back and eat, they're watching it. When they clean up, they're watching it. When they go out and sit that day, they're watching it. And they could take a whole day and walk around and just examine for the first time, how does this eye actually work? When I turn my head, do I tell it what to see? You don't need the anatomy of the optical system to learn this either. It's fun okay, but you don't need it to learn the lesson you need to learn because the lesson is it's not me, it's not mine, it's not myself. Essentially what is happening here is this is an event. It has not happening. It has a beginning, it rises up, it's there, it's happening, and then it passes away. So it's not there, it rises up, it is there, and it passes away. And that's from 111 in the Anupada Sutta. So it was a methodical way of teaching this. And then you do it with the ear the next day. Everything you hear. And you see how it really, the, it's an amazing experience to be alive. The hearing. Next day, you look, take a look at your, your smells, the odors of things, and how it works when you're making a salad, how, how it works when you're preparing food or cooking or cleaning the dog up or <laughs> cleaning the baby, changing the diaper. I mean, you know, or you're having to uh, wash the car and the kids have gone out and we won't talk about it. You have to deodorize the inside of the car, <laughs> you know, whatever, it, it, you know, you have to do. You're using your, your nose. And then the next day you do it wherever you eat. You can do it every time you eat your tongue. And if you're good at doing this and you're disowning it and not taking it in yourself, one thing that happens is sometimes you can get so good at it with your tongue. Maybe not. I just, it happened a few times for me while I was driving Bunty. Once in Texas, I said, this is the craziest thing. I was sitting there for lunch and I could tell where the flavors were on the tongue, the different part, pieces. And he would ask me questions. I could tell him where the salt was, where the sour was, where the sweet was, where the bitter was, I could tell him. And it didn't last, but it was there for a couple of days. So it's from, it's from playing the game with these sense doors that these things can develop. You're experimenting. So what are you doing? You're doing what two-year-olds do. You know, when they start to get curious about themselves, they start doing all this stuff. And if you were able to be home with them all the time and watch them, you would see them figuring things out. That's what they're doing. And maybe you didn't do it when you were little, or maybe you did, but it don't remember it because we wipe everything away. We learned like that when we get into the complexities of our world as adults, we, we, we let it disappear. It gets overwhelmed with thoughts that are in here. But as you're cleaning house and you're pulling the cobwebs and everything away, then um, you start to see more clearly how everything actually is working. So yeah, they're skill training. They're skill training. You look at the Chichaka Sutta, you know that one's skill training. Boy, that one is really structured strong, 148. Because the, uh, he's really working you over. One whole section is uh, when I, I told, teach you about that sutta, that it's broken into pieces. And I give you the breakdown for that sutta. And when you listen to it, you just go listen to it sometime. It's only one. It's exactly one hour long. Take an hour and just sit there and listen to Bhante read it or to me read it. And it starts out this uh, the six sets of six in it tells you what the six sets are. And then the first section, it's telling you, uh, you know, we've got a problem here. And you can see the monks sitting there by the lamp, listening to him saying, you know, there's a problem here. 
And if, if this first section, I think, is uh, if anyone says the eye is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of the eye is seen and understood. And since it's um, since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. And that is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say that the um, this is the eye is self, and thus the eye is not self. You understand what I just said? Okay. Then it goes to if anyone says the the sight is self, what you see, you know, the color, the form that you see is self. That is not acceptable. The rise and fall of the form is seen and understood. And since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. And that is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say the form is self. And so the I is not self and the form is not self. It's so meticulous. And then it goes I and then form and then I consciousness and then I contact and then I feeling and I craving. You see, six pieces of, for the eye, six pieces for the ear, six pieces for the nose, six pieces for the lips, six pieces for the body, six pieces for the mind. Okay, and then you can, you can hear these monks in your mind say, well, how did we get that way? And then, then he has a section and he says, the monk believes that this I is me, it is mine. He grows up thinking it is me, it is mine, it is myself. And he grows up thinking that the form is me, it is mine, it is myself. And he goes through all six pieces again for the six, six, you know, six sixes or 36 times. Okay. <laughs> and then the next one, you can see the monks are all sitting there going, well, wow, how are we going to get out of this? And then he tells them the next section. And he says, well, if you, if you want to get out of this, you have to walk around and say, you know, this I is not me. It is not mine. It is not myself. It is just an eye. And then the form the same way and the consciousness and the contact and the feeling and the craving. So there you go, 36 times again. So it's this very methodical how this is set up. There is no way, in my opinion, but I'm wrong because somebody wrote a paper about this and didn't even pick up that it was a skill training. But in my opinion, with the tech manuals that I've read for different types of things in my life, or how to operate a program where I had to call Everett or somebody to tell me how it works because I can't figure out the tech manuals anymore. But when you use tech manuals for, for technical stuff in the digital age, there is no way that you can hear this sutta and not think it must have been a skill training because then he goes into the part, the two sections about, so uh, if anyone, uh, this goes through a pleasant, the feelings and everything. And he says, if you are in this situation, you cannot get to Nibbana. And then he goes through the whole entire thing again. And he says, but if you do this, you can get to Nibbana. And he makes them memorize this whole entire thing. This is a teaching on what? This is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. This is just what it is. And it's anatta perspective, impersonal perspective not taking it on yourself. And so once you start using this sutta and start doing it a lot, if you listen to that sutta every day for like four days in a row or five days in a row, five times, okay? I listened to it for about 30 days, just every, every single day. And then when I'm working and everything outside, clearing land and building fires and construction work and everything, I'm doing it all day long and realizing it's really true. And then I was in a university and there was a, we each had to do an assignment and somebody got up and made fun of Anatta and said it wasn't Buddhist that some other religion had it first. And they did it and she, she described how it was that they had it first, but they didn't go into it to the depth that the Buddha did. That's the difference. And so I, I threw my papers away right then and there, I tore him in half in front of the teacher and said, okay, it's my turn. And I had 15 minutes and I took the section that talks about it specifically, explains it, not the whole sutta. I had like 15 minutes and I just recited the sutta and they were amazed, you know, she's reciting a sutta. Yeah. Well, I was doing the rebuttal against what the other person said by proving that everything is not me. It is not mine. It is not myself. 
and there's no denying it with that sutta that that was a training skill training thing so yeah it's meant to get you fired up with the idea of what he wants you to learn the dhamma not by what i'm telling you here he wants you to learn the dhamma by testing it for yourself and learning it through knowledge and vision of how things actually work so whatever the teacher we say guides for that reason bhakti and i had that big discussion way back when we thought we were going to teach teachers and we said no you know because i'm over here and uh, and you know i've had enough of the guru experience and I, we're not gurus and and we are we don't want to come across as teachers because teachers are related to gurus in the modern world too much and so when you just listen to someone and accept it does it run through? It will for a few people. But it has to come into your mind, like the Chinese were saying about how you learn and get to the deep enough point, deepest point, where it becomes part of you. And then when you drive in the country, you're seeing it all around you, everywhere. Just everywhere with everything, with every animal, with all this other experience that's going on, you're seeing the Anicca, the Dukkha, Anatta, you're seeing the dependent origination with the seven links. That's why we gave you the seven links. So yeah, use it as a skill training, jump on it and say, how can I turn this into a, a training? In these five sections here is the discovery that mind is the forerunner of all states, evil states or good states. But this idea, mind is chief, mind made are they, if one speaks or acts with an unwholesome mind because of that suffering follows one, even as the wheel follows the hoof of a draft ox. When the draft ox is pulling the wagon, the wheel just follows it. That's how secure the statement is it's saying to you. So you tell me, if you, if you are putting evil states and dark states and down states and stuff that pulls you down all day long, if that's what you're allowing in your mind and you're not letting that go and replacing it with good states, tell me what happens. But it's as sure as that wheel is following that cart, that's how certain he is of this. And then you have to test it to prove it for yourself. And then you have the one about, um, he abused me, he beat me, he defeated me, he robbed me. In those who harbor such thoughts, hatred is not appeased. The person who's stuck with the event that's in the past, and this comes back to the Bada Karata Sutta, okay, the one about um, the past and the future and the present time is the only place that you're alive, okay? If you're, if you're caught on a story in the past and you cannot let it go, it's just eating you alive. You need to do forgiveness meditation. You need to start and work with it and try to work it through seriously as a primary meditation with no other meditation involved in your life and try to do it to the extent where you're, you're feeling the clearance start. You need to do it the right way. And, you know, they, it's interesting since we started the teachers teaching and stuff and everybody wants to put their two cents in and they bend a little bit and they want to change the way Bonte did that. I won't change the way Bonte did that. I will not do it, you know? Because in the beginning when he was doing it, we had very high success. But now people want to change it here and change it there and change it here. And change. You know what it is? It's impatience. If the person doesn't get it, immediate gratification and make it work instantly, then they feel they have to change the ingredients. When all that's really going on is your, your brain is set up to protect you. And if the event is something that you locked inside, it's trying, it's concerned how you're going to handle it if you go back and to forgive it in a ptsd this is important too to understand the brain is actually your friend and it's trying to protect you because that's part of its job is to protect you from going into shock at the time of the event but also it's the job of it is are you strong enough to go back and review the event and see it now so the brain is very careful about trusting you to do forgiveness see but you have to talk to it like a little child and just let it say, you know, I'm okay. I'm an adult now. And I want to see how this, this stuff works and take a walk and just talk to it for a while. 
I don't care what anybody says about this, but that's how it worked for me. And it's worked for a lot of my students. You just treat it like there's a little two-year-old living with you and it's called brain. <laughs> His name is brain. And you say, look, I'm, I'm not butting into your job. I appreciate the fact you protect me, but I'd like to, I would like to get this out of my mind. So I'm going to look at it and try to go through this and get to the other side. So it doesn't, it isn't in there anymore. And then you work with one of the teachers pretty close, you know, so, and then uh, we had the unessential and essential one. We looked at that one. Then we said, um, one develops a mind that rejoices now and in the future. One rejoices if states, if both states, uh, in both state, the well-doer rejoices, you see. So you celebrate your deeds that are pure deeds. This is not bragging time, but you celebrate your good deeds and remember them and try to produce good deed, good uh, thoughts, good um, images in your mind that are like the ones through the good deeds that you did and how you felt and you compound it. It's like the more you smile in your practice, the easier smiles are going to pop up in your, in, in, in your life with other people. If you, if you make a point of smiling all the time for a few days and see what happens. And when you're smiling, all of a sudden somebody will say, Hey, hi, <laughs> and you, hi, <laughs> you know, nobody speaks to me, you know, yeah, but if you're smiling all the time, somebody can walk by and say, hi, and then you say hi back. One man had a shock of his life because people never responded to him at all. And he completely changed because of this, you see? But all it was was training his brain. It's okay to do this. And it actually feels good for your body, good for your heart, good for your circulation, good for your sleep, good for your stomach, everything. If you just smile, <laughs> that's it. Even my spaghetti. <laughs> Everything is working better. Okay. And then the, la the last one here, though a person recites the sacred text, but doesn't act accordingly, the heedless person is like a cowherd who counts others' cows. They have no fruit in the, no share in the fruits of the holy life. Yeah. But though the person recites the sacred text very little, but they act in accordance with the teaching. It's what we're doing. It's how we're using it in life. That's what's so important about this lesson and everything he gave us. If we're not using it on a daily basis and experimenting with it in the field, in our life all the time, then you're not taking it to heart, you see, to use his program. And how do we pay the Buddha back? We live the, we live the Eightfold Path. That's how, you see, okay? Any other questions? Does that answer your question okay? It's okay? Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. And so um, now, I'm sorry, that was a t I had to get the tick, you know. <laughs> We're invaded by ticks. <laughs> we only have, uh, so far, I think I have 700 ticks in that uh, jar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're hatching in here and it's not fun. Uh, but I got over the terror of it and said, Nam and Nan, they wouldn't dare bite me. They wouldn't. <laughs> so I could believe that. Anyway, um, okay. Any other questions? About anything else? You got another one? Ever? Anybody got a question? Um, Sister Kema, I, I just wanted to double check because you said you were traveling um, and you mentioned before this Sunday slots are still kind of... No, they're okay. Yeah, I talked it over with Bunty Damagavesi. We looked at the calendar and um, basically said between the two of us, we'll be able to handle it because where I'm going, I'll have a good setup with the internet. Okay. And we'll be working on, um, for that whole project, we have to work on marketing and just all kinds of stuff, setting up marketing and location and, you know, doing the stuff constantly on the internet. So this would be a good internet location where we are. Yep. And um, so we should be able to handle everything okay. And he said, anything isn't covered, he'll do it. So it's not a problem. We'll just work you and me and him to make sure it's covered each time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so it should it should be okay. Okay. Anybody else? If you know anybody that lives in Europe, you know, let us know. And um and just let us know so we can reach out to you if um 
we are going to open a retreat, a one regular kind of retreat, you know, with 20 people before we go home. And probably that retreat will probably happen sometime in July, you know. Um, that's what I'm seeing, thinking is going to happen. Um, and so um, we'll just see how how everything materializes, okay? Okay. So are we ready to say prayer? Yeah. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. And may they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Good. Oh, the bell is so glad to be back, you know. <laughs> it gets misplaced almost every time when I travel and I have to go and find out where it is. <laughs> <laughs>